You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 1, if you're not already there. Jonah, chapter 1. Let's begin by committing our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for the blessing of Your Word, that it is to have this, this light before us. It is our rock. It is our guide. We thank You that we can never go astray as long as we keep to Your Word. And we pray now that You would grant to us understanding and illumination as we look at it, and that Your Spirit would be our teacher you would guide us in truth, help us to understand your intention and purpose here in this Word. Bless now our time together and our study of your Word for your glory and for Jesus' sake. We ask this in His name. Amen. Jonah chapter 1, and I want us to read together verses 4 through 6. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Every time I read through the first chapter of Jonah, I always try and put myself into the position of Jonah, and I ask myself, what would I feel like if I were Jonah and I were on board that ship? And that is not a fun feeling or an enjoyable one because I get seasick at things that most people would never get seasick at. And I don't just get seasick, I get violently seasick. We had, uh, we went on vacation this last fall, Deidre's sister took us out on a whale watching cruise. It was about one hour and just off the coast of Cape Breton Island. It was a great thing. We were out on, the, on this big boat that would probably seat about 50 people or so, kind of all crammed in there. It was a double-decker deal and so it was a good-sized boat, bigger than just fishing boats that I've been on before. And by the way, I don't get seas- I don't get motion sick out on the lake. I don't get motion sick on just normal ski boats or fishing boats. I can do that all day long. That doesn't bother me. It, I think I'm not sure if it's bigger waves that does it or bigger boats that that do it. But I've never experimented to find out. Because I'm not interested in finding out why it is. I just know stay off the sea, stay off any boat bigger than a small boat on the Lake Ponderay. So we went out on the whale watching thing, and we were. Uh, out there all kind of lined up along the edge of the boat, and we asked the, the lady who was kind of giving us the tour, she said, you should start seeing the whales start to surface now any minute. So we're scanning the horizon, thinking we're going to see these little humps kind of come up on the horizon out there. And we asked, you know, how far off should we be looking? She said, oh, not more than 40, 50 feet. it will be right there. So I mean, it's between, between these two walls, you have a boat and three or four whales that were surfacing. It was great. But about 20 or 25 minutes into this little voyage, which I'm thankful was not a three-hour tour, we got, I became well aware of why it is that I avoid boats and waves and the sea. I'd kind of forgot about that and just sort of got on board and not really thought of it. But then after about 20 minutes, I thought, well, I need to sit down. And I did. And I sat down in the middle of the boat and I watched the horizon. Anything that was holding still, I stared at it like it was a television screen. And I was watching a playoff game. I was intent on the, the horizon itself. And I, I wrestled out the remaining 40 minutes, occasionally glancing at the whales running over, taking a couple pictures and rushing back, sitting down and staring at the horizon. So when I put myself in Jonah's position, I know that I would not have been below board sleeping. I would have been above board, right up on the edge, on the railing. And while the rest of the crew was hurling the cargo into the sea, I would have been hurling as well, but something entirely different. Because I get seasick, but there's no indication that Jonah got sick. There's no indication really that from the text that this affected Jonah in any way whatsoever because he was sound asleep in the midst of the storm, in the midst of a great crisis. So we're going to be looking at verses 4 to 6 this week. And last time that we were in the book of Jonah, when we left Jonah, we left him fleeing from the presence of of God, getting on board the ship, verses 1 to 3. We saw him do something that in terms of a Jewish prophet was an utter scandal. The only place in all of Scripture where you read of a prophet of God doing the opposite or disobeying a clear direct command from God. The only place you read it is Jonah. There's no other prophet that we have that gets a word from God who hears it, understands it, it's clear, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. He turns around and does something else. But Jonah does that. In terms of Jewish thinking, that was scandalous. So Jonah 
disobeyed a clear command of God. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship. He paid his fare and he got on board the ship. And the text says twice in verses 1 to 3 that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And when we were studying that, you remember we saw that that has nothing to do with Jonah thinking that he was somehow going to be able to get away from where God was. He was not trying to flee away from an omnipresent God. Not trying to get outside of God's sight or knowledge. That's not what it means. What it meant was Jonah was resigning his prophetic office. He was leaving the place where God had dwelt. That is the land of Israel. He was turning his back on his people on His land, on His calling, on the temple, on His God, and He was going as fast and far away from what God wanted Him to do as He could possibly move. That's what Jonah was doing. So in verses 1-3, to we see what Jonah did. Now in verses 4-6, to we see God's reaction to Jonah's disobedience. And this storm in chapter 1 really is the central feature of chapter 1. It's not so much Jonah's disobedience, which sort of carries the day or is the center the central issue of the chapter, what is the central issue is what God does in response to Jonah's disobedience. And we learn a tremendous amount about the character of God and the purpose of God and how God deals with His children just as we watch Jonah. So the storm in verses 4 all the way through the end of the chapter is the central idea. This, Everything that happens in chapter 1 happens because of this storm. And we pick it up in verse 6. Now in order to give sort of some structure to the things I want to share this morning, we're going to sort of pin them by observing three different responses to the storm. We see the storm in verse 4. Then in verse 5, we see the sailor's response to the storm. At the end of verse 5, we see Jonah's response to the storm. And then in verse 6, we notice the captain's response to the storm. So we're going to observe the storm in verse 4. Look at it. what Jonah says. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Now, I love the way the NASB translates that. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. And the NIV, the King James, the New King James just say simply that God sent a great wind. I love the imagery of hurled because that's certainly the idea. When you hurl something, you throw something at something else with great force. Not reckless abandon, but with great force. And that's the idea here. The Lord is behind this. And the word order is significant. It says in the Hebrew, the Lord hurled, which is kind of odd. Because Hebrew writing typically has the verb first and the subject second. But Jonah intentionally switches those so that he places the subject at the beginning of the sentence. And he is doing that, intending to show to us that God is the active agent behind this. He wants us to understand this is a supernatural thing. It is the Lord who is the cause. God is the one who is acting. This is in no way a normal storm. This is in no way a run-of-the-mill storm. This is in no way anything that can be explained by natural causes or natural phenomena. The Lord is responsible for this, and the Lord hurls a great wind across the surface of the sea so that a great storm was on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. This is a disaster in terms of the sailors and certainly in terms of Jonah. This is a calamity, and who is responsible for it? The Lord is responsible for it. The Lord hurled the great wind. I've got a question for you. Do you have room in your theology for that? Who do you think controls the weather? God controls the weather. Now, I ask you, just the beautiful weather like we enjoy today and yesterday, or all weather? All weather. Even the calamitous weather? Even monsoons and hurricanes and tornadoes and natural disasters? Acts of God, as insurance companies like to call them? You know what's disturbing to me is every time there is an act of God somewhere in the world that kills tens or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, Christians rush to the microphone in order to take any credit away from God for that. He didn't foresee that coming. He didn't want that to happen. That wasn't against His will. He didn't cause it. He didn't allow it to happen. It just happened. Christian leaders rush to the microphone to rob God of His glory for doing something like that. And the insurance companies got it right. They say it was an act of God. Amazing how insurance companies have a better theology than some Christians have, isn't it? And that's the truth. God controls the weather. Let me give you some Scripture references. Job chapter 37. Under the whole heaven He lets it loose, and His lightning to the ends of the earth. For to the snow, He says, fall on the earth, and to the downpour and the rain be strong. From the breath of God, ice is made, and the expanse of the water is frozen. The moisture he loads the thick, with moisture He loads the thick cloud. He disperses the cloud of His lightning. It changes direction, turning around by His guidance that it may do whatever He commands it on the face of the inhabited earth, whether for correction or for His world or for loving kindness, He causes it to happen. 
Psalm 147, who covers the heavens with clouds? Who provides rain for the earth? Who makes grass to grow on the mountains? He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts forth His ice as fragments. Who can stand before His cold? He sends forth His word and melts them. He causes His wind to blow and the waters flow. Listen to Psalm 107. He spoke and He raised up the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Jeremiah 10.13, when He utters His voice, there is a tumult of water in the heavens, and He causes the clouds to descend from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and He brings out of the wind the wind from His storehouses. Amos 4, verse 7. Furthermore, no, let me ask you this. All of those things so far, rain and snow and sleet and hail and thunder and lightning and the wind, all of those, God says, they're my doing. I control them. They're in my storehouses. I unleash them at my will. I do them wherever I want. How about drought? If He controls the rain, is it not true that He also controls where it's not raining? That would only make sense, wouldn't it? Amos 4, verse 7, Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and not on another city. I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the other part would not be rained on and would dry up. Now, who's responsible for that? We're tempted to say God is responsible for all the wonderful weather. We give Him thanks when it's really nice outside like today, right? Yesterday was a beautiful day. Today is a beautiful sunny day. It's one of those days when you can't wait to get out of church so you can go home, start working in the yard, go out and have a weenie roast or do something nice outside. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's probably going to snow again before summer hits, but today it's a beautiful sunny day and you want to be outside doing yard work. And we praise God for that and we thank God for that. But what about when He dumps 14 feet of snow on us in one month's time? Then what do we do? Who's responsible for that? God is responsible for that. Do we just praise Him for the good weather? And not for the ill weather? Or what we consider to be ill weather? Some people are tempted to say, well, I think God controls the weather up to a point, but then things veer out of His control. He doesn't control tsunamis and natural disasters and earthquakes and hurricanes. Really? Does that bring you any comfort whatsoever? can't bring you any comfort whatsoever. And what verse is that that says that? He controls all of it. And here we see God as the active agent in sending an entire storm, a disaster from the human perspective, against the people that surround Jonah and against Jonah for Jonah's disobedience. And God Himself is the one who is responsible for that. Now, why does He do that? Now listen, just as a footnote, since we're talking about natural disasters, the one thing we can know is that if a natural disaster happens and it's somehow related to weather or somehow related to anything that goes on in the weather patterns, that God has either done it Himself or He has allowed it to happen. Either way, the credit rests with Him. And He's a big boy. He can take care of Himself and His own reputation. And He is fine when we acknowledge that God is behind this. He has either allowed it or He has directly caused it. We can know that because Scripture says that. The one thing we cannot know is why it happens. And this is where we get overboard. And this is where a lot of very well-meaning but very, I think, uh, misled Christian leaders often step over the, the bar and go outside the pale when they try and say, well, God brought this upon this city or this region or this country to punish them for their whatever. He did this in New Orleans to punish them for their homosexuality. Or He did this to this country to punish them for their idolatry. We don't know that. There's no way we can know that. We can know that God did it, but we can't know why He did it. Maybe He did it because He just wanted to send a lot of rain. We can't know the secret mind of God. But in the case of Jonah, we can know why the storm was there. Why was the storm there? We know because the text tells us Jonah was being disobedient. And this was for the purpose of bringing Jonah back on track. Friends, I want you to understand something. Even though this is a disaster and a calamity, listen, it is a loving disaster and a loving calamity because God is pursuing His prophet. And God is bringing something that from the outward appearance looks like affliction, it looks like adversity, and it looks like a disaster. But the purpose behind it is love. Because God loved Jonah, He would not allow Jonah to go down a path that would end in His own destruction. Because God had a purpose for Jonah, He pursued Jonah. So behind the affliction is love. Behind the discipline is love. Behind this pursuit of Jonah is love. And that is the same way it is with you and I. When we disobey and God sends a chastening or discipline to us, there is a reason for it and it is always loving. He does not discipline us or chasten us or pursue us because He hates us. 
If your child were blindfolded walking down a road that you knew was going to lead right off of a cliff to their eventual death, and you did nothing to stop that child, would you be in any way considered a loving parent? Not at all. The same thing with God. Jonah is on a path that is going to result in his own destruction, and God knows that, and God is sending a storm to pursue him to avert this and to get Jonah back on track. It is a loving discipline. Now I ask you this. Why didn't God just get another prophet? There were other prophets. Jonah's not the only fish in the sea, so to speak. There were other prophets that he had available to him. Jonah said, no thank you, I'm done, I'm over, I'm resigning, I'm leaving my land, my people, the temple, you, it's over. I'm heading to Joppa. He got down to Joppa, got on the ship, sailed out to sea. Why would God fill with you all of this trouble for Jonah? To get Jonah. There were other prophets. He could have said to Amos, Amos, I have an errand for you. Amos was a contemporary of Jonah. They probably knew each other. He could have said to Hosea, Hosea was alive at the time, Hosea, I've got an errand for you. I want you to go to Nineveh. He could have said to Jonah, Jonah, that's what you want? Fine, have it your way. i got other prophets, I'll find another prophet. Why didn't God just grab a prophet? I would suspect that Hosea, if I were Hosea, at least this would be true of me, I would suspect that Hosea probably would have been more interested in going to Nineveh than dealing with his wife, Gomer. Could have done that. He probably would have volunteered for the trip. But why did God send Jonah? Why pursue Jonah? It's a lot of work to go through. Hurling a wind. Finding, uh, going, uh, sovereignly directing the casting of the lot so that the lot would fall to Jonah. Having the sailors throw him overboard. Preparing a big fish to swallow him up. Miraculously sustaining him for three days and three nights in the belly of the whirl, whale. Regurgitating him back up on land. Calling him. And then the, the worm and the plant and all of that thing. It's a lot of bother for one prophet. When you got other prophets, why not just send another? You know why? Because Jonah needed this mission more than this mission needed Jonah. That's the answer to it. God was not just interested in getting a message to Nineveh. He could have written it in the sky. God was interested in using Jonah to get the message to Nineveh. God had the right man. God had selected Jonah. He had chosen Jonah for the task. Jonah was his prophet. He was the one that was supposed to bring the message. And nobody else, God didn't change his mind. He didn't go grab another prophet because Jonah needed Nineveh more than Nineveh needed Jonah. And that's the way it is. God doesn't always just ask us to do things just for the sake of asking us to do things because He needs something done. He could ask others to do it. God asks us to do things for our sake so that we learn. Jonah had to learn an important lesson. That's why he didn't get another prophet. So that's the storm. Now let's look at the three responses to the storm. First, the response of the sailors at the beginning of verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. That's the response of the sailors. The number one response is fear. By the way, fear is the thing that characterizes these sailors all the way through chapter 1. You see it in verse 5. They were greatly they were afraid. Down in verse 10, after Jonah says, look, I'm the reason for the storm, it says they were exceedingly fearful. They were exceedingly fear, uh, afraid. Then in verse 10, after Jonah is thrown overboard and the sea is calmed, it says that the sailors feared the Lord greatly. So the sailors all the way through chapter 1 are fearful. They're fearful in the verse 5 of the storm, in verse 10 of the purpose behind the storm, and then in verse, sorry, yeah, verse 10, verse 16, in the God behind the storm. So their fear moves from fearing the storm to fearing God. But they're always filled with fear. To show you how intense this storm is, ask yourself, if you were an experienced sailor, would you have been afraid that day? And the answer is yes, you would have been. But the fact that experienced Phoenician sailors who always sailed the Mediterranean Sea were terrified of this storm, the fact that they're terrified indicates to us the severity of the storm. They had been on the Mediterranean. They would seen storms. They would sailed through many storms. Spring and fall always brought storms and big ones to the Mediterranean. And anybody who sailed on the Mediterranean had to get used to a, a squall now and again out on a boat. But this is something that has these men terrified. They understand this is supernatural. This is unlike anything they have ever seen. Even the most experienced sailor, maybe he was the captain, this is unlike anything he had ever experienced. Which is why they're all calling on their gods. They don't just hunker down and say, well, let's eat some bread and wait till morning, daybreak. No, they understand this is something of a nature that is about to destroy their ship. And so it says then they called on their gods. Phoenician men, they would have had lots of gods, all of them idolaters coming from different parts of the empires of those days. Those sailors would have had different deities, even sometimes depending on what family they belonged to. They would have different deities, so they begin to pray. Does that do any good? It doesn't do any good. Why not? Because idols don't hear prayers. They don't have ears. They can't hear. They're not alive. 
fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. Idolatry is just demon worship is all it is. And it's not their idols who are behind the storm. It's not the idol who had caused the storm. And God is not interested in honoring the prayer to an idol, which is why He doesn't do anything to it. Since not all roads, all roads do not lead to God, God is not interested in using the sincerity of a pagan to accomplish His purposes. And so this, the storm does not let up or abate whatsoever. And God doesn't hear their prayer. He's not interested in answering their prayer. God doesn't say, well, they're sincere and they're really trying to reach out to me. No, they're worshiping demons, false gods and idols. And they're idolaters. And so God doesn't hear that. And the storm continues and increases in its severity. And then they begin to do the last thing that any of them would have ever thought to do, and that's to pitch their money overboard. you got to be in dire straits when you start throwing your money overboard. Was it their money? It was their cargo, which was the same to them as money. They were going from Joppa to Tarshish, probably taking something like wheat from the land of Israel or Palestine and shipping it all the way, 2,500 miles away, to the western coast of Spain, to the city of Tarshish, where there was a, a silver a, a silver production, silver smelting. So they probably had a boat that was loaded with wheat, possibly loaded with gold, possibly loaded with gems and jewels and rocks and all that other good stuff, and they begin to pitch that overboard. Why are they doing this? It's to lighten the ship. When the ship rises up in the water, and without all of that weight inside the ship to respond to the forces outside the ship, with all of that weight inside the ship, it's just going to twist and turn, and they know, look, we either throw our stuff overboard or we go down with our stuff. What are we going to do? We're going to throw our stuff overboard. As a last-minute resort, they begin to pitch all of the cargo overboard. Now, since we're talking about the sailors, I want you to observe something. Do you observe what Jonah's sin cost these men? You see that? Look what Jonah's sin cost those men. Everything. Sin, our sin, your sin, my sin, always puts other people in peril. Always. That's why we ought to hate it. We always put other people in peril. Maybe our spouse, possibly our children, or our parents, or our boss, or our neighbors, or our relatives, or other church members. Our sin always costs somebody else. In this case, with Jonah, it costs these sailors... They were on the verge of, of death themselves. They were in uh, uh, mortal peril. And on top of that, it cost them all of their possessions, all of their trade, all of their cargo. It cost them all of that. And they weren't even guilty for the storm. The storm wasn't even sent for their benefit. Primarily, it was sent for Jonah's sake. And yet, because of Jonah's sin, other people suffered. Remember Achan, the city of Ai, Joshua? Achan's sin cost the lives of other people in the city of Ai. David's sin of numbering the people brought a plague upon the nation. David's sin with Bathsheba cost his family, his kids, the life of that child. Bathsheba, her husband, Uriah, his life. It cost the entire nation as David was eventually run out of Jerusalem, jettisoned from his throne, rebellion within his own home as his son tried to take over everything. All of that it cost him because of that one sin. Sin is, we are not islands unto ourselves, and sin is never just restricted to us. If you ever say to yourself, you know, I could do this, and I'm probably the only one that will be affected by it, you're lying to yourself and you're believing a lie. That is never the case. Sin always imperils somebody else, to some extent or another. So the sailors, they're afraid, they cry out to their gods, and they're pitching their cargo overboard. That's their response. Now look at Jonah's response at the end of verse 5. And this is kind of given to us as a flashback. Jonah says, uh, Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and lain down and fallen sound to sleep. That's kind of a flashback. Likely, Jonah fell asleep before the ship ever left port. But Jonah was in the hold of the ship down below, having gone there when he first got to Joppa and got on board the ship. He went down below, took his stuff, and he went to sleep. They got out onto the, the sea, and with the pitching and the rocking of the boat, Jonah was sound asleep. Now, the question you're asking in your mind is, how can any man sleep through something like that? Right? I can sleep through something almost as severe as that, because I can sleep through almost anything. How does Jonah sleep through a storm like that? Wouldn't the rocking of the ship and the pitching of the ship just push him off of his bunk onto the ground against the hole of the ship? Wouldn't he be rocked awake by landing somewhere? Well, in those days, the ships, at those, in those times, they got men slept on hammocks. Let's just grant that it was a hammock. And even if you say, well, he was just swinging on a hammock back and forth, being rocked to sleep like a baby, you still would ask yourself, how could he possibly sleep through something like that? What is behind this? What type of a mental state, what type of a spiritual state, what type of a physical state was Jonah in 
that he could sleep that soundly. Because the text says he fell sound asleep. He was sound asleep. And the word, the Hebrew word means a deep, deep, deep sleep. He was out like a light. He slept like a rock. He was out and nothing was waking him up until the captain comes below. How did Jonah do this? What's going on in his mind and in his heart that enables him to sleep like this? I think there's a way of understanding what's going on here because I don't think that the deepness of his sleep is just an incidental detail that's not important to the text. And people have suggested at least three different explanations for how he could sleep through this. And let me, let me offer you those three. It could be, number one, first of all, that Jonah was running from a guilty conscience. His conscience was bothering him. When we sin, our conscience plagues us. It burdens us. And it begins to wear upon us. And bear down upon us. And it has a way of exhausting us. When we're trying to soothe our conscience, that's very tiring work. And so, Jonah has run from God. It's possible that his conscience was just eating him up. It's possible that he is sleeping in order to sort of uh, muzzle his conscience because sleep will muzzle your conscience just as well as alcohol or entertainment or any other activity or inactivity. As long as you're sleeping, your conscience isn't bothering you, provided you're not dreaming about your sin. But sleep is a good way of muzzling the conscience. It could be that Jonah was simply sleeping as a way of sort of quieting his conscience. By the way, when your conscience bothers you, you have two choices. You can either confess your sin and deal with it and get your conscience cleaned, or you can deny your sin and sort of head down that road again and try and deal with the guilty conscience. It could be his conscience that was bothering him. Second, it could be Jonah was just simply indifferent. Sin has a way of doing this. He was indifferent to his own health, his own well-being, the safety of the crew. He was indifferent to the storm. He was indifferent to adversity. He was indifferent to his surroundings. He just simply didn't care. Sin has a way of doing this. Sin has a way of, of dulling our affections and numbing our affections to the point where we just don't care. We don't care about ourselves. We don't care about the security of other people. We don't care about the concerns of other people. We don't care about the health or the well-being of other people. We're not interested in anything. Anything that goes around us. We just become numbed to everything as a result of our sin. It's hideous. Sin has a way of destroying our sensitivities to things and especially the feelings that we have toward others and about others. And about ourselves, it could be that Jonah is just completely indifferent. He doesn't care, and he can fall asleep, go to sleep in the midst of the storm, because he doesn't care what God sends his way. He just has lost all care or concern about anything. Total indifference. Sin does that. By the way, you cannot coax a man or a woman out of their sin by trying to point out to them the damaging effects that that has on them and their family. You know why? Because they don't care. You cannot convince an alcohol a drunkard don't believe in alcoholics. You cannot believe convince a drunkard to give up his drink by showing that him is destroying his family or his kids. Why? Because he loves his drink more than he cares about anything else. You cannot convince a man to stop viewing pornography and being involved in lust by showing that it's hurting his wife and his children. You know why? Because he doesn't care about them. Thomas Watson in his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, says a man would sooner part with a, lust, a, a child than with a lust. A man will sooner part with a child than with a lust. And that's true. Because sin brings an indifference. That could be what's going on with Jonah. It could be his conscience. It could be indifference. A third thing, it could be just physical exhaustion. Sin has a way of exhausting us. We try and cover up our sin. We try and ignore the sin. We try and soothe our conscience. We try to deny the sin. We try to try to sin without being caught. We try and sin and get away with it. We try and sin and ignore what's going on. We try and sin and then cover up the effects of those sins and then sin to cover up those effects. And then we keep on sinning and running from God and running from our conscience and running from our sin and running from our accountability. It's exhausting work. And factor into that the fact that Jonah had to go from Gathheper all the way to Joppa and get on board the ship and take his possessions. And I would bet you, because I told you last time, this was not a rash decision that Jonah made. I would bet you that he had plenty of sleepless nights between verse 2 and verse 6. Plenty of sleepless nights in which he agonized over this decision. Should I go to Nineveh or should I just up and leave my prophetic ministry, leave my family, leave my friends, leave my land, leave my possessions, leave my God and go to Tarshish? Plenty of sleepless nights. It may be that he got down in the hole of the ship and this was the first opportunity he had to sleep in days. And when he fell asleep, he was gone. Comatose. So that's Jonah's response. Sound asleep, completely indifferent to anything that's going on around him. Until the captain shows up. And look at verse 6. Look at the captain's response. 
The captain asked the question that would be on all of our lips. He approached him and said, how is it that you're sleeping? How can you sleep at a time like this? How can you possibly still be asleep? Haven't you heard the rustling of the sailors as they pitched the cargo overboard? Can't you hear the creaking timbers? The cracking timbers? Can't you hear this and the waves bashing against the side of the ship? How can you possibly sleep at a time like this? And then the captain says to him, Arise, get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be merciful to us and we will not perish. What does the captain want? The captain is just as fearful as the rest of the sailors. And the captain wants to make sure that all of his bases are covered. we got all of our sailors petitioning all of their gods. And none of this is helping so far. Then they find one guy on the ship, and probably the one guy on the ship, who's actually asleep. And the captain has to be saying to himself, what would be the irony that this one person's God is the one behind all of this? Let's wake him up and see. Wake him up. You call on your God. We want to make sure that every base is covered. All of the gods are being petitioned. And cry out and see if your God will be uh, merciful to us and that we might not perish. Listen, there is so much irony in that statement. There's so much irony in what's going on. Let me give you a couple of the ironic things. Do you notice, first of all, how closely the captain's words echo the words of the Lord back in verse 2? Arise, Jonah. Go and cry out to Nineveh. Jonah arose and he fled. And the captain says, Arise and cry out to your God. Those those words had to have sounded awfully familiar to Jonah. Oh, the irony of it. The singing of it. Almost as if God was speaking through that captain to Jonah's heart, which is exactly what I think was going on, by the way. That's one irony. The second irony is how ironic is it that a pagan would actually have to be used by God to rebuke a Jewish prophet? Isn't that horrible? That a pagan would be used to call upon a Jewish prophet. A pagan would have to call on a Jewish prophet to call to his God. That was a disgrace that just put Jonah to shame. That this idolater would have to say to him, you need to pray. Because Jonah didn't want to pray. That's ironic. It's also ironic that this the whole reason that Jonah is on the boat to begin with is to flee from God, and now he's being asked to call out to his God. Ah, see, that was the one thing I didn't want to do. That would have been going through Jonah's mind. You can ask me a hundred things. That's the one thing I didn't want to do is call out to my God. He didn't want to do that because he was in the midst of sin. The last irony is that this one man sleeping on the boat was the one man responsible for all of this. That's almost comedic, isn't it? There is a prayer meeting going on among pagans. They're all petitioning their God. They're all praying. And the one man on board this ship who actually knew God, who could actually pray to God, to whom God would actually listen... He's sleeping through the prayer meeting. That's almost comedic. But do you notice what sin will do to your prayer life? Jonah's a study in this. Did Jonah pray when the captain asked him to pray? Text doesn't indicate that he did. I don't think he did. I think that was the one thing Jonah did not want to do. Jonah's not interested in doing it because that's what disobedience does to your prayer life. It dries it up. The irony of it is that the one thing you need to do when you've been disobedient is to pray to God And that's the last thing that you want to do. Because the one person you do not want to face is the one person you have to face. And Jonah's not interested in facing his God. He doesn't pray. And listen, had Jonah even prayed, would God have heard him? As long as I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, David said. Without repentance, Jonah was in no position to petition God for anything. Without repentance, Jonah was in no place to seek the face of God or to request anything of God because he still had not repented yet. That comes in chapter 2. But at this point, Jonah is not repentant and so he doesn't pray. Let's wrap this up with just two basic observations. One thing we can learn from Jonah, this is first. Descent into hell is always an easy path. Uh, God could have sent a thousand roadblocks to keep Jonah from leaving Gath Heifer. A thousand things could have happened. A thousand doors could have shut. He could have been mugged between Gath Heifer and Joppa. He could have got to Joppa and they could have told him, look, there's not another boat due in or out of here for months. And he would have been forced to go home. There are a thousand things that could have happened to avert this disaster, but God didn't send anything. God didn't do anything. He let Jonah pursue his path of disobedience all the way out into the middle of the Mediterranean before God did anything to change his course. That is the same thing with you and I. God does not always 
smack us with one small disobedience. I stop reading my Bible and I say, I'm done for that for a couple months. I might do that and not die the next day in a car accident as a judgment from God. God doesn't always send massive judgment for small disobediences. The descent, the way of disobedience, is always easy at first. Always easy. And it always looks good. And it's not until we pursue it and we run with it for a while that eventually we run into affliction or uh, disaster or the storm comes. You may be quite a ways into disobedience before somebody grabs a hold of you and shakes you and says, listen, you fool, what are you doing sleeping through this? How can you sleep at a time like this? Wake up and call upon your God. The second observation that I would make is this. Most of your life and most of my life is not made up of crisis obedience moments. Your days are made up of small obediences. Small obediences. Every day that I have lived is made up of small obediences. Just little things. Not doing this and doing this instead. And doing this instead of doing this. And avoiding doing this and doing something else. Your days and my days are small obediences. It is a long obedience. The Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. It's not day after day after day of crisis moments where you have to choose between two massive objectives. Those things are rare, they are few, and they are far between. You're going to wake up tomorrow, and by the time you go to sleep tomorrow night, you will have been faced with a thousand opportunities to obey. Probably none of them huge. All of them small. But here's the irony. Our small obediences are the things that make the big difference. That's our Christian life. And when we disobey in a small thing, that leads to another disobedience, which leads to another disobedience, and eventually you're on board a ship out in the middle of the storm, and God is trying to get your attention. And may God give us the grace to avoid that path. If you never depart from the path, then you never have to turn back and climb back out of the hole. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to You for the lesson that we learned here from Jonah. We thank You, God, that in Your grace You pursue us as unworthy sinners. It is not... We who have found you, but you who have found us. And you have hounded us like the hound of heaven, and you have brought us to yourself. And you have never been content to leave us alone. We thank you that we are yours, and that you cherish us, and that you do not want us to stray far, or stray at all. We ask God that you would protect us and give us the grace to maintain that obedience and to walk with you in truth and integrity. Thank you for the opportunities that you give for us to obey, and thank you that you teach us obedience. And we pray that we might learn that in order that we might experience the blessings of your presence and your power in our lives. May you be glorified now and may you watch over each one of us as we leave here in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.